squared away. Okay. So I want to welcome you all to our Polar Connect event. We're um, talking with Polar Trek teacher Nick Lefov and his um, researcher Amanda Coates. They're up there in Tulip Field Station, which is north here of Fairbanks, Alaska, and they've been looking at spiders this summer. Um, we're excited to learn more about their project today and hear what they have to what they've been doing the last few weeks since uh, some of us talked to them a few weeks ago um, about their expedition. A few things about this Polar uh, Connect event and the platform that we're using. It's called um, Blackboard Collaborate, and you should see a uh, slide here that um, I'll get there. Um, which shows the uh, presentation um, should be showing up in the middle. Um, a few of you are testing out uh, voice over IP and talking to your microphone. You click on the talk button once to open the mic. You click on it again to close it when you're done. If you have questions as you go along, you can feel free to type them in the chat room, or you can raise, um, click on the little hand icon, um, which is above the list of participants, and that that lets us, it's like raising your hand and lets us know you have a question and we can call on you um, and uh, at, you can ask your question. Um, I don't think anybody's joining us by phone today, but if you are joining us, um, it's nice to courtesy to mute the background noise in your phone by pressing star six to mute and star six to unmute. And like all of our presentations, we are archiving this and it will be on online and on the website and available for later viewing. Um, or sharing with others in another couple of days. So um, if you are joining us, um, instead of going around the room and having everybody introduce themselves like in a normal conference, um, we ask you to type in your name, where you're from, and if you have any students with you, if you're in a classroom, put them in there. But just type in the chat room who you are, where you are from, or maybe what your affiliation is with uh, Nick and Amanda and we'll introduce people that way. Um, just a heads up, Sarah and myself, Janet Warburton, we're moderating this conference. We're with uh, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. We're a nonprofit that's based here in Fairbanks, Alaska that hosts the Polar Trek program. And Polar Trek um, is a program where we place teachers from around the United States and we match them up with researchers both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And these teachers get an um, opportunity to go out with the scientists, learn more about what the science there is happening in the field, get their hands um, into these projects, and then they take it back to their classrooms and hopefully bring it back to you. Um, wherever you may live. And uh, if you're interested in Polar Trek, and if you're a teacher that is wants to do something like this, um, we should let you know that in another month or so we're opening up our, our application period to host teachers to go out on expeditions. So check the website for things like that. When we get to questions um, during the presentation, the best way is to type your question in the chat box where many of you are introducing yourselves right now. Uh, Nick and Amanda will try to keep up with the, the chat um, and the questions as they go along. They did a great job the last time. And at the end of the presentation, of course, we'll have plenty of time for you to ask your questions. Again, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you and then we want you to talk clearly and, um, and direct your question to Nick and Amanda. And click on the button when you're done. That's important. Um, Okay, I think that's it. Oh, one final thing. I should let you know that Nick and Amanda are the only two that will have video today. Um, the rest of us will just be watching the slides and have chat, but we'll be able to see their friendly faces on the screen in just a moment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Amanda. All right. Um, okay, so I was just wondering if our video was going to appear larger so I could see if we were in the, uh, in the shot. But uh, yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Um, before we get started, I do want to give Kiki a chance to pop her head in and say hi because she's actually heading out in the field um, to help out with some squirrels this morning. So we don't want to hold up that experience. Come on over and say hi to everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Kiki. I'm Amanda's research assistant this summer. And uh, oh, I can see if everyone's saying hi to me in the chat room. 
<laughs> and I just graduated from Duke, so just up here for the summer helping out with the spiders. <laughs> I, I think as we, the longer we're here, the less formal we get with these things. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's distracting to read that while you're talking. Um, but yeah, we're uh, we're here at Tulick Field Station. It's a little after nine o'clock uh, a.m. here, and um, going to get started with a little bit of an o overview about Polar Trek and uh, the path that led us, well, led me to uh, where I am right now. Um, Polar Trek is, like, it's an incredibly um, well-organized organization. We're very well supported. Um, this started with my application process back in, I think, September of last year. And uh, at that point, um, it was a lot of waiting and some interviews. And much later in February, there's a picture of uh, myself with some Polar Trek teachers under the Aurora and uh, just outside of Fairbanks. That was in February of this year. We had a week-long orientation. Um, and that orientation itself before I even got in the field was probably the best professional development experience I've had for my entire career. Um, and there's a picture of this is the Polar Track crew underneath the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, which I have to say is much shinier in Fairbanks than it is here. I don't know if they polish it there or what's going on, but um, here it's a lot duller. But it is cool that I've now um, seen a good chunk of the length of it and we'll be heading south of Fairbanks to see another portion of it soon. Um, in February, or in uh, April rather, sorry, I had a chance to go to um, an International Polar Educators Workshop in Montreal, um, and that was held also along with um, the International Polar Year Conference, which is a science conference, where I got to learn about um, a lot of polar science uh, and get a really good grasp of what's going on and why polar science is such an important um, process understanding other processes going on that's connected to basically everything I teach when you really look at it. Um, but the Polar Educators Group is, again, it's another good group of uh, people from, who had 75 countries represented, something like that. I might be off on that, but, um, and that's one, again, where we're coming together and looking at polar science and what's going on in polar science and how to bridge that gap between what's going on in the field with researchers and what's going on in the classroom. Um, <laughs> All right. So before we get started, a lot of people often ask why study the polar regions, why um, why this focus on sending people to the Arctic or, or to Antarctica or close to Antarctica. Um, and right now, there's a special emphasis from the National Science Foundation to study the polar regions um, because we're we're realizing that to understand larger global processes, especially in a time of a changing climate on a global scale you really need to understand what's going on in the polar regions first. Um, it's where you see changes rapidly or you see significant changes. Yeah, and we also learned during this, this conference in Montreal, um, we got a little bit of a taste of the, the social and political um, mm -hmm. interest in the polar regions as well. They're, they're also really important, which we're not looking at so much this summer, but um, there's a lot going on both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Yeah. There we are. All right, so um, where we're sitting right now, we're at Tulick Field Station. Um, we're about 160 miles north of the Arctic Circle. We've got about, I think, 90 people in camp right now. It's been fluctuating between 75 and 100 since we've been here. Um, but it's, uh, it's a good bit north. We're not quite as far north as Lisa will be when she heads to Barrow, but um, we're up there just the same. And I'll give a little more info on Tulick Field Station here um, in just a second. But getting here, uh, just getting here alone is quite a, uh, quite a good adventure. It's about a 9 to 12 hour drive from Fairbanks on the Hall Road. If you've ever seen the show Ice Road Truckers, you may be familiar with it. Um, it's one of the roads in a couple of the seasons is my understanding that they do drive. And uh, it's absolutely beautiful landscape that goes on for hours and hours of just incredible landscape. Um, what's neat is watching the change, uh, the transitions in the type of landscapes that we're seeing. So we're driving through a boreal forest um, for quite a ways and uh, we get to cross the Yukon River, that was kind of a highlight, and uh, cross the Arctic Circle. Of course, you have to stop for a picture for that opportunity. Um, but as soon as you hit the Brooks Range, uh, you no longer see trees. It's really quite a dramatic change. You go from seeing a lot of trees to you see what's actually labeled as the last tree um, on the Dalton Highway or the, or the Hall Road. 
Um, and then as we come down the other side of the Brooks Range, there, there are no more trees and it's really just nothing but it's just tundra, for as far as you can see. Um, when, we got, when we got here, this is a picture of the uh, sign at uh, Tulick Field Station, which also doubles as a disc golf target. Um, but when we got here, you can see that the lake was pretty much iced over. There was a small area where the ice had uh, melted already, but we've seen quite a bit of change. And you'll also notice that in some of the pictures, um, things look brown, and now they're very green. And in fact, we're starting to see some fall colors in some of the plants. Um, Tulick Field Station, uh, that's a, I love that picture, and I'd like to say we have that view today, but our visibility is a little bit limited, um, and that's okay because we're, we're indoors right now, but, um, uh, yeah. um, this, is, uh, this is a research station for some long-term ecological research, and uh, it's been running in some fashion since the mid-70s starting out as a camp for people who were working on the pipeline. Um, but now it hosts quite a variety of uh, research going on here, which makes it, a, I think, a really special place for me to be this summer um, to get a sense of a whole variety of science. Um, it's run by the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, Institute of Arctic Biology, and it hosts researchers from well, all around the world. Mm -hmm. give you a little bit of an idea of um, what life is like here. A lot of people ask about that. Uh, we are living in the tundra, so there, there are some things that are a bit different, but to give you a sense of uh, what our housing looks like, um, we do have a dorm, which is a little more uh, comfortable, I guess yeah, I should say. My first short term in faculty. Yeah. Um, and that has, that has a handful of rooms in it, um, but again, very, very dorm-like. And we have, similarly, we have some uh, that are more on a sort of smaller trailers with uh, with a porch. So that's uh, we're going in order, I think, from probably the most comfortable to well, I don't know, I, I can, it's what you like, I suppose. Um, we do have what we call tent city down by the lake. So if you want a little more privacy, you can absolutely um, set up your own tent and stay down there. It's a little quieter um, there than it is in the housing areas. And where I'm staying is here in these weatherport tents. Um, in fact. That is my tent, I believe. No, wrong way. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's the view I have of the Brooks Range when I open up my door in the morning. So unless, of course, we get a little bit of fog. But um, it's really a nice view. And the Weatherport tents, they're about 12, 12 by 25 feet. Um, mine's divided into two sections. One's a single area and one is, has room for three people, as mine does. Um, I've only had a roommate for a few days. And it's... Um, it's pretty, pretty spacious and actually pretty comfortable. It's, uh, there isn't a lot of privacy, though, in terms of sound. You can hear everything. Um, I have someone who's snoring I'm getting quite used to. I don't know who it is, but it's, uh, it's something you do get used to with time. So it's, uh, but really, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite comfortable accommodations. But yeah, this, this back wall here and even these outside, this, it's basically just vinyl. Um, so you get a it's pretty thin. There's not a lot of insulating value. There's not a lot of sound barrier. But, you know, it's fairly spacious um, and more comfortable than I expected. Mm -hmm. Our lab spaces, uh, similarly, and we'll talk about um, there not being any permanent structures here at this site in a second, but it's um, our, la our lab is this one right here. Um, most of them are tents. They're set up in large tents. And ours is probably, again, it's not much bigger than 12 by 25. No, it's a little wider. 20 by 25, maybe, like a carport type size, perhaps. Um, and you can see they, they fold up quite nicely, go into pallets, and that way they can take them down when not needed and move them from spot to spot. We have a number of um, trailer structures also that function as labs. And what's neat about these, uh, there's uh, our lab doesn't have any lighting. We do have some electricity. Um, we brought in three space heaters on one particular day, which wasn't the best idea because we blew a circuit, and it's probably not the safest thing to do, but um, we won't do that again. But yeah, we do have electricity, but no lighting. We don't really need lighting because we have 24 hours of daylight here. Um, when you're doing work with, say, microscopes, it's nice to have a little more direct light, and in those cases, we have moved to some of these other facilities. Um, very few have running water. A couple do, but for the most part, um, we use five-gallon jugs and five-gallon buckets to wash dishes outside. 
And um, we do have some rather old facilities. This one was built in 1954, I think. I've spent a number of hours sitting in front of the sign that says when it was built. So it's, um, that's our isotope free lab. And uh, Kiki's standing on the porch of it. Do you want me to, uh, oh, do you want me to, uh, I'll have Amanda explain why there are no permanent structures here at uh, Tula Field Station. Oh. Sure, yeah. I guess well, Nick will show a picture of the dining hall later, I think, mm -hmm. um, and you'll get an idea of the different ways that we have to um, account for the permafrost here. But So the ground is permanently frozen all the time. It's called permafrost, and so um, that just really limits what you can do in terms of building structures and carrying water and, and whatnot. And Nick will get into that a little bit later. But um, the other thing is that the Tulik Field Station doesn't own this land. We lease it from the Bureau of Land Management. And so we have a, a designated area that we're allowed to put uh, building structures on. And it's, we call it the pad. And so um, we're just limited in the amount of space we have. So we have to be able to move the, the buildings around. And for example, um, that picture that Nick showed with all the, the, weather, the weather ports, the tents where everyone sleeps, um, next year they're going to start building a dorm, so they need to completely rearrange the configuration of, of that whole area of camp. So um, that's, nothing is permanent, and um, you can see some of these labs, they have wheels on them so they can move them around as well. All right. It's, uh, and I, I have these pictures here to give you kind of a sense. Um, we're pretty remote. It's, like I said, it's about between 9 and 11 hours to drive here from Fairbanks. Um, I guess the next closest place is Dead Horse. Yeah, north of here. In north of here, and that really is a, they also live on a pretty, it's a pretty bare existence when you think about it. Um, so we're very remote, so we have to be pretty much a, a self-sustained village. Um, so we do have a number of amenities here. We have, a, this is more or less our medic station. And uh, we do have a health club. That is the Tulick Health Club. It's a garden shed, essentially, with a treadmill and a little bit of other equipment. But it is nice when it's either too wet, too cold, or too buggy, uh, which happens often to be able to get some exercise. We have some full-service shops. Um, people have to make modifications to a lot of their equipment. And uh, we also have to repair vehicles as they come in. Well, we don't. We have people who are trained to do that. Um, but they do a great job keeping the vehicles running and the support vehicles that we take to our field sites running in good shape. The haul road can be pretty rough on some vehicles. Um, so it's, uh, it's really good to have that on hand. We can't just drive down the street to a power, to an auto mechanic to get things fixed. And flat tires are very frequent up here as well yeah. because uh, the haul road, the picture that Nick showed, it's basically it's a gravel, most of it's a gravel road the whole way up. And it's an industrial road with, with tractor trailers carrying equipment between uh, um, you know, Fairbanks and down south up to the, the um, to Prudhoe Bay. So it's a pretty rough road and uh, you can see most of the windshields are cracked, uh, flat tires are pretty frequent, so it's important that we have the support here to fix things up. Yeah, um, <laughs> and the, the sections that are paved on the haul road are I think actually in worse shape than the dirt sections. Uh, I prefer driving on the dirt sections. Um, and a week ago, and I'm going to be putting this into a journal entry, but I'm still working on some things with it. We had a group of four people um, in a car from Argentina pull into camp. They had just returned from uh, going up to the Arctic Ocean at Prudhoe Bay, um, and they'd driven from Tierra del Fuego, and they were on their way back. But they came in with a broken windshield and two flat tires. Uh, they were wearing helmets and goggles. But it's, um, it was quite an experience, and uh, it seems very fitting for the setting. Strange things just tend to happen here. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it must have been quite a trip. Um, other things that we do have, we, yeah, we have a community center, and right now that is the center um, of the Olympics. We have the Tulip Olympics going on right now. And uh, we do try to uh, make sure we're entertained. People live here as well as work here, and you're a long time away from your home and your family. So uh, you know, it's, not, it's more than just a place to work. We do have a sauna, and uh, it is quite nice, but it's also, it was put in as a means of showering. We didn't have showers until a few years back, and um, that is where most people shower and where most of our showering takes place. So I'll talk about uh, how limited our showers are here in a few minutes, but um, it's a nice way to go in, heat up. You can jump in the lake, which I just started doing uh, recently. It's still pretty cold. But if not, you can warm up some water and take a bucket shower out on the deck, and uh, that's, it's really not so bad, and it, it is nice to have. But again, started out, I think, as a necessity more than as a, a luxury, but we're thankful for it all the same. Um, 
our dining hall is really, again, I think this is another great benefit for the scientists, and I didn't really realize that until I got up here and started working. Um, to have a cooking staff here is really quite a benefit to the scientists because you don't have to worry about cooking and cleaning and purchasing the food and all the logistics that go along with that. And we eat quite well. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of talk about the Tulip 10. I don't want to get on scale right now. Um, the food is incredible. We have great desserts, two different desserts a day, and it's Thai night tonight, but I'll, I'll get the food in a little bit. So um, it's nice. And when the, before the bugs got here, we spent a lot of time outside on this deck, which has a great, great view just overlooking um, both Tulip Lake and the Brooks Range. So it's kind of nice to, you know, just have a place like that to sit and eat and relax. And sometimes we still go out, but we wear, um, we wear some D or some bug shirts at the least. Okay, so the, um, the logistics here are really amazing. We're, we're really lucky to have a great staff and, uh, for example, a wood shop and a tool shop and, and you know, power tools and everything at our disposal. And it's really unique being up here because we, we don't have the opportunity, you know, if you forget a screwdriver, um, a, you know, I, I didn't know the first time I came here that there would be all the, all the support for the science. Um, that's a really big deal because if you forget something, you're you're out of luck. You, there's no you know you can't go to a Home Depot. It's a, a 12 nine to 12 hour drive to Fairbanks. And um, we were just up in Dead Horse at the Arctic Ocean uh, this weekend, and Scotch tape for four rolls of Scotch tape it was twenty dollars. Yeah. So you don't want to have to go buy supplies there. Um, and so it's just really great. And the you see people are are very um, innovative in uh, when they have to come up with different plans for their research or different structures. Uh, you really make do with what you've got here, but this yeah. staff is really fantastic. Yeah, and it's, uh, I think one of my first tasks here was uh, to widen the funnels that we had for our pitfall traps. So I ended up in this building this uh, here looking for just a saw and hoping that that would work. And it, and it did a pretty good job, but then they had a drill press behind me. So I switched and started using the drill press and it made it, you know, the job so much easier and so much, uh, I think, better. But there, there's a scrap pile you can't see very well in this picture, and it is one of my favorite places um, to see people digging through. Because whatever materials you're done with, whether it's uh, sheet metal or PVC piping or just uh, lumber, whatever's left, people will throw under there if they think it's usable. And it's really fun to walk by and see people digging under there and getting excited when they find something good that they can use because I am finding that um, much like as a teacher where we have to get innovative and use what we have available, in field science people are very creative and some of the contraptions they make are really, it reminds me of stuff that my students do and it's, it's really great. I mean, it's, it gets the job done. So you, you are limited and that's I think a challenge to working up here. Um, food, yeah, I did want to include that. This is our menu board, and uh, I can't, I'm too excited at dinner time to take pictures of my food. I forgot, I know I told Sarah I was going to do that, but um, the food is really quite great. It's quite a lineup here. And uh, yeah, like my, this week's dinner menu was really, I'm quite impressed. But, um, and the food, the quality is really quite good. It's Thai night tonight. I probably already mentioned that because I'm really excited about Thai night. It's very good. Um, and as well as in terms of, uh, in addition rather, to the food that's available for our dinners, we get uh, three warm meals a day and we also have food available to us 24 hours a day. Um, there's pretty much always leftovers and uh, you can warm those up at any time because a lot of people work through the meals and don't make it in until late and uh, a lot of people work long hours. Fourth meal of the day is a common thing sometimes and we have, um, it's sort of like a convenience store being set up with all this uh, Candy bars here available. Um, I'm finding Snickers is a required field staple. It uh, kind of gets you through the afternoon for energy, as well as uh, a wide variety of drinks. And those are just out there for us um, as part of the services provided here. So it, it makes it very convenient, and uh, people pack lunches to go in the field. And yeah. And, yeah, and for those of you that haven't ever seen other field stations, um, normally it's typical for the researchers to take turns cooking or you might stay in a tent or cabin and, and cook for yourselves or, or rotate between dif different lab groups that would be making different forms of rice and beans every night. Um, but it's fantastic to have the, the kitchen staff and three meals a day here because it means that the focus is really on the science that you can spend your time working and not thinking about cooking and, and, um, and cleaning and those kinds of activities. So we're really lucky. And it's a good motivator in the field on the cold wet days when we're out getting muddy. 
food comes up as what's for lunch, what's for dinner. Um, and that sometimes that's all it takes to pull you through. So, and uh, yeah, you can um, in Antarctica. You do burn a lot of calories. We we don't quite burn as many as they do because we're not struggling quite to keep our bodies up to that temperature, but. I'd like to think we burn a lot. I don't know. Uh. Depends on the project, maybe. I think yeah. some of the, the groups that work in the lakes and the streams that are hauling big backpacks of water. Yeah. We have a less physically strenuous uh, research project, but certainly other groups do a lot, a lot of exercise. Yeah. And it's an active place. People are out and about quite mm -hmm. frequently. Um, well, we get away from food for a minute. So I'll get hungry again. Uh, life on the tundra. Yeah, we, we are on the tundra. We are on permafrost. Yesterday I went out with a group and one of the things I did was help um, measure the active layer, which is the thawed layer of soil, uh, how much soil we have available before we hit that block of ice that is permafrost. Um, and I was getting down to about maybe three feet tops and that was, that was a lot. Yeah, but when we first got here this season, for example, we needed to take soil temperature and moisture and we couldn't get the probes into the ground because the, the ground was basically a block of ice. Yeah. So it's thawed uh, in some places a foot or, or two feet uh, just in the last month and a half that we've been here. Yeah, and in other places it's not much deeper than eight inches or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, just, it's really varied, but so we're, we're on top of, um, we are on top of that permafrost and it settles throughout the year, but also we're seeing now um, thawing into deeper areas than we than I think ever thought possible, and that was the thing that I learned about at uh, orientation as well. And this is uh, this is the building we're sitting in right now. We're in the East Dining Hall, and um, you can see down here these this structure, and what that basically that's essentially a system of jacks that the building is set on. And in addition to making it a non-permanent structure, as the building settles with this freezing and thawing of the ground you can use a gigantic wrench and a laser level and check it and uh, level it out that way. And they do this periodically. The first year that this building was up, um, the back end of it sank four inches. So, I mean, if you can imagine the, the place you're sitting in right now, just one side of it sinking four inches, it's tough to keep a structure in good shape. Um, but they are well prepared for that here and they've made these considerations. Um, even our plumbing, and I'll show you this down here, it's all pipes have to be run above ground. We have plenty of fresh water from a well, and that has to be circulated all above ground. You can't really bury pipes because you, you hit ice pretty rapidly. Um, so even our electrical wires are run above ground, and all of that water has to be circulated continuously. There are heaters in there, so should it freeze, they can thaw it out and keep the uh, water moving for us. It's not so much a threat right now, of course, but in the winter time, yeah, it absolutely is. And um, Wastewater is where we have to save the water, though. It's not what we consume, it's what we're getting rid of. So um, all of our water has to be hauled out to Prudhoe Bay at a cost of about $1.25 a gallon. Um, when you consider that the average person in the U.S. uses 100 gallons of water a day, that's, that's a lot of money. You multiply that, that out times about 80 people here a day. Plus, um, some of the science requires water, wastewater as well. So it's a bit of a challenge, and you can't dump it here because, well, it is a research, long-term ecological research station, so you certainly don't want to impact the water quality that people are studying. Um, so all that water does get hauled out, and um, water conservation here is really quite important, and they, we've done a great job. Um, we use about 13 gallons per person per day, and again, the average in the U.S. is 100. So we're only allowed two showers a week, two minutes per shower. Um, most people don't even do that. Um, some people have only showered once since they've been here. <laughs> Not gonna, but <laughs> well, as Nick mentioned, <laughs> a lot of the people use the sauna for bathing. Yeah, yeah, and, and the sauna is great for bathing, and that, that's uh, any time it's open, you're welcome to go and do that, and it's quite relaxing. But uh, the water tanks, even our this is a picture of uh, what we call the towers, and uh, the towers are basically pit toilets that are above ground. They're the tallest structures in camp. There's three of them. And uh, you go up these stairs to use the outhouse, and instead of the pit being in the ground, we have a tank that's above ground because, again, we can't bury it in the ground. Um, and then we have a truck that comes through about lately, it seems like once a week, um, to pump that out. And uh, I have learned not to eat outside while that's going on anywhere on the pad because, it's, um, as you can imagine, it's not the nicest thing. But, yeah, we do have to haul out the water. So water conservation has been... Um, you know, even just that two-minute shower sounds extreme. It's really not. To turn on the water 
and then turn it off to self up and then turn it back on, which is what I did this morning because I'd be seeing people from the outside world. Um, it's really not a hard thing to do to conserve water. I'm, I wouldn't certainly build a tower in my backyard, um, but there are ways to do it. It makes you more conscientious of the water that you're using, for sure. Yeah. And when you go home, too, which is nice. Yeah. Um, let's see. Going on to recreation, yeah. Uh, I did see some questions about, and I, um, it's kind of weird to get distracted as I'm talking and seeing that, but, um, and it would make great math problems at school, Rick Allen's the water use per person. But the recreation, we do have the uh, Tulip Olympics going on here. They go on every four years. Um, and uh, but the, all of these pictures are ongoing. I don't have any Olympic pictures yet, but they will be coming up. Um, so even uh, and, and things are a little bit different because, like I said, people live here. Uh, some people are away for four months at a time. Um, I mean, the two months is not a, an uncommon clip of time either. Right? And it's people are away from their families, and you live here. And this 80-ish person community, this is your entire, I mean, this is your entire existence. You, you do talk with people outside, but you don't see anyone from outside, really. So it, it's a little bit bizarre, so you have to find ways to entertain yourself. And uh, with 24 hours of daylight, we, we do a pretty good job of that. Um, people work very hard here, and they work very long hours. I've walked by labs at 1 a.m. and seen people in them working. Um, and pretty much everyone works at least six days a week. So when we do get time for recreation, I think people really tend to make the most of it. Even a game as simple as horseshoes, again, because we're on the permafrost and we're on the pad, um, even the horseshoe pits are elevated on pallets, which is really kind of fun. Um, I think it's made me better at horseshoes because you have to land pretty close just to get within the pit. Uh, fishing is pretty common here, a common thing. Uh, some people do it for work. I think they're also doing it for fun, but um, it's our friend Justin catching a grayling right outside the window here. Um, this is Amanda, and you can see I'll put the pointer on the ball. That was a great hit. And uh, she should have entered the home run derby last night, but she didn't, um, which was better because she had more energy for badminton. But um, yeah, we do play t ball. And that picture, I'll show you again in a minute, that was taken close to midnight one night to give you an idea of the sunlight. Um, there's soccer almost weekly. Badminton is uh, one of our favorite activities here. Mm -hmm. And um, Amanda and I lost in a best two out of three. We went three games and right to the last point last night. Mm -hmm. First round of the Olympic play, but we're still in play for the tournament. So uh, hopefully we'll come back. I think we'll be uh, we'll be in good shape. And you notice that the badminton, just oh, yeah. in terms of going back to trying to make use of whatever we can, um, so the, the ground here, Nick will get into it, but it's really lumpy. We don't have mm -hmm. grass. So if you want to play soccer, for example, on the left, I mean, you're on the gravel pad all the time all the time. That's the only flat area that there is that you can use to play sports. So um, everything's on the gravel pad or uh, badminton, for example, is in, uh, that's basically a car garage that they use during the day to repair cars and, and other equipment. And then we just set up a badminton at, at night. So everything is multi-use. Mm -hmm. really, and there's a basketball court in there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a picture of a Sunday I went mountain biking. We do a bike tent um, with well-equipped mountain bikes. We have a bike mechanic here on staff. Um, he does other things as well, but he is a certified bike mechanic and keeps the bikes in good shape. This is uh, one of our nicer bikes that you sign out and take out um, on trips, but we have, um, we have a little cruiser one-speed bikes that are used quite frequently around the camp. It's kind of nice. They're just laying outside. You see one, grab it, take it where you want to go, leave it. Someone else can take it. Um, it's really nice. And uh, here's Jenga, and Jenga will also be a, uh, an Olympic event um, that I'll be participating in. I think tonight the Olympic board is beside us, so I kind of glance up at it. But yeah, um, we have large-scale Jenga. Everything's bigger here in Alaska, including Jenga. And uh, the problem with that is it's also located near the bonfire, so you have to be careful to pick it up and put it away, otherwise it might end up in the fire. So, um, and uh, you know, how can I say, we, we do play disc golf a little bit. <coughs> and even disc golf, again, is an example of using what you have. We don't have official nets. Um, so here's a low-flying aircraft sign. That's one of the... Uh, one of the things that we throw at. And uh, again, it's being resourceful. But hiking, I would say, is probably the most popular mm -hmm. activity here because we, we are located in some really beautiful country. And uh, you can get away to the Brooks Range or get away to one of the local rivers or, you know, really your hiking options are quite, limit, uh, quite limitless here. Mm -hmm. oh. ah, and I, I did want to bring this up. Um, this is a picture of Team Spider at the Arctic Ocean. 
And you may have heard us uh, before we started talking about this. We made this trip this Sunday. Um, drove up to Prudhoe Bay and uh, went to the Arctic Ocean. It was a beautiful day by Prudhoe Bay standards. About 51 degrees, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the wind wasn't that bad. It was cool and windy enough to keep the mosquitoes away, but um, you know, it was a clear day. And in fact, our tour driver was saying it was one of the nicest days he's seen in years that he's been working up there. And uh, we did swim in the Arctic Ocean. It was uh, about 45 degrees, which is pretty warm for the Arctic Ocean. So. Yeah, it was it was uh, warmer than we expected, but it was uh, it was really a great time and a great uh, a great experience that I think you know I'll remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we do live with 24 hours of daylight here, so from uh, May 26 to well today the sun never sets. Today will be our first sunset, um, and it, it will be brief. It will be very brief, and I don't know if it will be all that distinguishable. I don't think we'll even. I mean, I, I think we'll probably be in bed by the time it sets. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it is fun to watch, and this is facing north, and the sun just kind of takes this path from uh, up high in the sky to dipping down. This is about the lowest point I've seen of that in this picture, and then it raises back up. So it just kind of goes in a circle around us rather than setting. And um, I find I require a lot less sleep here, and it's uh, it's really a fun thing. It's a neat privilege to have. We can go out for a hike after work and not to worry about daylight. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is again another picture of us playing t-ball right around midnight to give you a sense of what the 24 hours of daylight really looks like. Um, am I tired from all the awake time? I am tired today. But overall now I'll, I'll bounce back. I did rebound well. Um, because it's, it's just such a fun place to be. I hate to miss out on things. All right, so the Arctic animals. Um, these are all pictures of wildlife that I've taken since I've been here. And I got another good shot of a moose yesterday, uh, which is pretty exciting, and a bird that I got to hold. But um, And we got several, we saw a lot of wildlife on the way up to the Arctic Ocean, including snowy owls, but sometimes things are a little bit far for uh, a camera. But you do, we do get to see a lot. But, you know, th this to me is, I'm really excited about these pictures that I've gotten to take, but we spend so much time outside and in such a, a remote area that it's just not all that uncommon to see these things. And it's a real privilege. It's, uh, it's quite exciting. So there's uh, quite a range of wildlife. And these are some of the bigger, more charismatic fauna uh, that we'll talk about. Um, probably the most uh, threatening <laughs> to us are the mosquitoes, though. And I, I did want to bring in this slide. And, and the pictures just don't do it, it justice um, for how many mosquitoes there are here. It's really it's hard to believe. It's ideal habitat because that um, frozen soil, when it melts, you get these ponds of standing water and these pools of standing water everywhere and it's basically a wetland and it's great mosquito breeding habitat and they only have a few months to live and they come out in force. You literally see clouds of mosquitoes at times and um, we have to wear bug netting a lot of the time and bug suits and on this day I'm wearing a bug suit fishing. I'm also wearing 100% deep. Um, and that works for a little bit, but then you sweat, and then they're on you. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're just fierce. Um, I was reading last night because I was trying to pull some stats on this, but I guess uh, there were a few years of it being really intense up here. And so it's going to vary from year to year depending on rainfall, snowfall, et cetera, and temperatures. Um, but in 1994, the record for the SWAT contest, which we haven't done this year, but they used to have a contest where you would take your open hand and, there's my other, and SWAT an area. Um, on you, and you would swat them gently so you could count the splatters and count how many mosquitoes you got. And the record in 1994 was 278 mosquitoes with one swat. And I would have thought that was impossible, but now yeah. I, I can see that happening. Yeah, this picture doesn't do it justice. No. Normally, you have a, a huge swarm at, just everywhere. Your entire body is swarmed with mosquitoes all the time. And yeah. something Nick, uh, he was wearing deet here because he was fishing, but we're not allowed to wear any bug spray at all on our project. So usually we're completely covered from head to toe and uh, with, with bug shirts and uh, you know thick pants and uh, we also wear rubber gloves because otherwise they cover your hands. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a rubber glove rip with one finger sticking out of it. They found the finger. So they're, uh, they're quite something. The flora and the landscape, um, and, I, and I can't, if I say this a lot, I'm sorry, but the, the landscape is just some of the most beautiful land I've, I've ever seen. Um, that is standing in the doorway of my Weatherport tent, that top picture. That's what I look at on a clear day. Um, you know, from frozen rivers that we walk on and sometimes under, 
um, to even just the moss and the lichen. Uh, you see lichen that's rust colored orange and bright, bright yellows, something I'm not used to seeing. Um, cotton grass flowers look like something out of Dr. Seuss. It's uh, the small things here are really beautiful too. I think I used to associate the Arctic with you know wolves and bears and moose and and still do, but really the small things. It's a it's a huge landscape with very tiny plants, and the tiny plants are really the I think some of the most fun things, and they drive and, and affect most things here. And um, this is a picture of Amanda on one of our first days, and you can see how brown the tundra is compared to now. It's you know it's lively and green. Um, but this, these little hills of grass, these are tussocks, and they're essentially dead plant material and roots. And uh, in between them are these very watery and wet areas. And uh, she's pointing those out here. And you can see I used to think of tundra as being very flat and uh, very homogeneous, just a flat plain. And it's really not at all. It's really quite dynamic. And you walk around on these, which we do most of the time. And tundra slogging is, uh, that should be a sport for the Olympics, although we don't want to impact the tundra. But it's, it's hard to do. I mean, you're walking in wet, mushy stuff, and then you walk on what feels like you're walking on uh, slightly deflated basketballs. It, it can be tricky. I've, uh, I've fallen. Yeah. I've crept. <laughs> Luckily, it's pretty soft, so when you fall, it's, you know, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, and uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk about the, about how, uh, we're talking about a lot of the living things here, and, and I don't wanna skip how the non-living or the abiotic factors in these environments are really, more so here than maybe anywhere else, as far as my understanding has been, or it stood out to me here more, I should say. Um, the abiotic factors or the non-living factors tend to drive everything else in this landscape. Um, if you want to, yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's just really interesting here, and in, uh, just a very extreme landscape. So, the, remember, the ground is frozen all year round. And so um, because of that, just um, everything has to be able to adapt to these uh, extreme temperatures where it can get to 70, 75 degrees in the summer and can get to negative 40, negative 60 yeah. in the winter. So everything here is just adapted to this really crazy extreme environment. And um, you can see in the top left picture here, so this is just the ground, it's a pool of standing water. Basically when it rains, um, because the ground is frozen, the, the soil can't absorb the water, so you end up with these standing pools of water, um, and which the mosquitoes love. And, um, but all these plants need to be able to uh, withstand flooding and frozen temperatures and snow in July if it happens. Um, so really like the I would say the majority of the research that happens here is more ecosystem ecology, where they're looking at nutrient dynamics, uh, snow patterns, uh, water, um, but the, really more of the, the abiotic, non-living uh, factors that drive the major ecosystem processes here. And our project is kind of unique in that we're looking at animals and, and trying to see if whether the animals uh, can have any sort of impact on these like huge uh, abiotic forces that are going on. Yeah. It's really, uh, it, even the bird project I was at on yesterday, um, there are people who study birds, but I spent most of my day taking soil measurements for them. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a little different. And uh, this is Team Spider, and I know this seems like a strange place to put in an introduction, but we're going to talk about the science that we're doing here. Um, and of course, uh, Amanda, myself, and you did see Kiki a little bit earlier. And this is us on one of our hikes on a day off. Um, so beautiful valley that we spend some time in. But uh, this is the research project. This is the reason why we're here. And uh, this is Amanda's project. And it's, uh, it's really, it is a unique project here. We get a lot of questions about it, even from other researchers. But uh, we are working with wolf spiders. And um, here's a female wolf spider, and there's an egg sac. And we're seeing less egg sacs now, in fact, very few, almost none. We're seeing spiderlings now. And for a while, it was almost all that we found. Uh, the males, you can see, have these little boxer glove uh, appendages on the front, and that's one easy way to identify them. And what we're looking at a lot of the time is um, their role in the food web. So their food web, we're looking at things that they eat. And uh, Amanda will spend the next several months looking under a microscope at uh, some of their prey that you can see here, um, these springtails and a whole variety of mites. Um, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so wolf spiders are the the largest and most abundant invertebrate predators up here, and they really make up a, a large part of the of the biomass in terms of predators. So, I just did a, a back of the envelope calculation a couple months ago, and 
Um, if you consider the wolf spider biomass compared to the actual wolf biomass uh, per kilometer, wolf, wolf spiders have 30 to 40 times more biomass uh, in the ecosystem. So you would imagine if they're so much more abundant in terms of biomass that they might have um, some kind of an impact on the way that the, the living part of the ecosystem works. And so what I'm interested in for my project is whether you can look at the effects of wolf spider predation um, and whether those, uh, the effects of wolf spider predation impact the way that the food web is structured, you know, how many springtails you have versus how many mites you have. And, uh, you know, the prey of the wolf spiders, they eat the fungi and bacteria that um, feed up upon all this, this dead plant matter in the ecosystem. <laughs> um, sorry, the list. I think we just lost oh, the power. Oh, um, and so, so we're interested in, in the effects of the wolf spiders and whether that can impact decomposition ultimately. Um, and decomposition is, is really important up here because since we have such a short growing season and a short summer, um, the, basically the plants are producing biomass, but then uh, because it's so cold, the summer is so short, there's not enough time for that biomass to decompose. So um, Nick will show you a picture in a minute, but basically the soil is kind of like the equivalent of our leaf litter. If you walk into a forest and you see all this leaf litter, it's all this dead plant matter. Well, here, that's kind of what the soil is made of. Yeah. Um, and so one of the important processes up here is, is decomposition. And you know, when the plant matter decomposes, it releases carbon dioxide and methane, and then you have a positive feedback on climate change. So we're trying to figure out whether these tiny little spiders that you would normally consider an insignificant part of the ecosystem might have an effect on the rates of decomposition. Yeah, and it's, uh, decomposition is probably a part of most studies here, if not all in a way. Yeah. So it's a, it is, it's a lot more than just spiders. Yeah. And it is that these little, these little guys make, and girls make up a huge part of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so we have three basic, three essential questions to what we're doing. Um, and the first one, we're kind of looking at environmental changes in feeding ecology at three different sites. And this is our southernmost site in the Attigan Valley. You can see our sampling plot down here. Um, the other two are basically experiments. And the one we're looking at, um, the effects of predation on that food web, as Amanda said, eating those uh, springtails and mites. And the other one that we're looking at, um, we're looking at decomposition. We're actually measuring rates of leaf litter decomposition to uh, We'll get to that, in, I guess, in an visual slide. So we do work in the third, the first part of that study. We work at three different field sites. One's just up the hill here. I can see it out this window. It's about a 10-minute hike at Tulick Field Station. Um, and Tulick, in this picture, is right here, over to the right. The other one is due east of us. It's at the same latitude. Um, you would think it'd be pretty similar in terms of when the snow melts and the seasonality, but it's really quite different. And that's over at Navia Creek. Um, that's our second site, and that, in Navia, the snow melts about, is it a week later? It's about a week later, yeah. About a week later than it does here. Um, our southernmost site is at Attigan, and Attigan's here in this valley, and, and because of the position of the mountains and the airflow and a number of other factors, even though it's only maybe a 20 mile, about a 20 mile drive to the south of us, um, the snow melts about a month before it does here um, at Attigan. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing quite a difference in the types of plants, where the plants are, um, where the spider communities are. They had egg sacs very early there when we didn't see egg sacs here yet. So it gives us three really different sites to compare, and I think that's a pretty neat thing, and it's such a small area. And in fact, yesterday I was at a site, I forgot to tell you this, fresh blueberries are there in bloom. Oh. So the blueberries aren't, um, they're just out here, but they're still not ripe, but they're very ripe in other places. Um, Going up the hill here, this is largely what we do. We have these, uh, we have five big blocks. Within each block, we have a mesocosm, which is basically a piece of metal, um, aluminum flashing like you use on your roof. And it goes, uh, it's to contain the spiders and their communities. And since some of those things live below ground, um, the mites and the springtails, we also make sure that that goes away into the ground and it contains the whole community. So uh, we spend a lot of time working over these and doing what I like to call tundra aerobics, especially when you're reaching out over one of these um, open top chambers. So we have these small, uh, we have six of these in each block. And half of those are covered with these OTCs. And the OTC is an open top chamber. It's basically plexiglass 
or I'm uh, sorry, fiberglass um, that works as a mini greenhouse to increase the temperature inside there. So we're looking at the effects of slightly warmer temperatures on these communities as well. So within, um, so we have half of them covered with an OTC, half of them not. And within those, we have um, controls, which we leave alone, whatever the spider population happens to be, it happens to be. Um, we have high density plots where we double the spider population by sometimes literally running around the field and chasing spiders with cups, picking them up and dumping them in there. And then we have low density plots where we um, pull the spiders out as we catch them mm -hmm. to keep the density as low as possible. We want to look at the impacts of the amount of spiders on predation, so on their prey, and also on um, the rates of decomposition. Mm -hmm. All right, so arthropod sampling. Yeah, looking at spider prey, um, we do, w the main way that we do this, we have pitfall traps which are basically we use urine cups. Um, I was out with a group yesterday that does a similar thing. They use solo cups, but with our cups we can seal them nicely and they're a nice consistent size. So basically the prey and the spiders we use these for as well, they'll run along the ground and fall in. It's a pitfall they can't get out. Um, and then we spend a lot of time looking at that. We also sample the soil. Um, and when we sample the soil, we're cutting, uh, you can cut a slicer, so instead of having to core it like we do, say if I were to do this in the Carolinas, I couldn't cut a square of soil, you just couldn't do that. So we sample it with a, um, with basically a tube that you pound into the ground in most places, that's pretty common, but here I slice that with a bread knife. Um, and then we take those samples and we essentially, um, we weigh them and more or less bake them under some lamps and uh, on these funnels on five gallon buckets basically with a cup of alcohol underneath. And what that heat does is it drives all of the spider prey out of that soil and down into the cup. And then um, this process is actually pretty quick and simple. It's the hours and hours and months of staring over a microscope to figure out what's in it. That's really the time consuming part of this job. Yeah. So for example, this, this block of soil, or I guess it's basically dry, yeah. I mean, more or less like leaf, compacted leaf litter. Um, but in a block of a soil like that, you could have maybe a thousand uh, little columbulums and hundreds of mites. So um, you don't realize it when you're walking over the soil, but you're, you know there are just thousands of little animals in there, and so it takes a lot of time to go through them afterwards. Too. And with uh, <coughs> within these, we're taking a lot of other data as well. Um, you can see here, this is a temperature logger that we have in each of our uh, plots, and that gives us regular measurements of the uh, basically the spider's ground temperature. And to shade those, we got really high tech. We used um, coffee cup lids with hot glue uh, to these little metal rods that we just tapped in. So it works. Uh, we were a little bit innovative, but these are quite high tech. And then we just gathered those about a week ago for the first time. And Amanda plugs them into her computer with a USB drive and gets that data, and we go put them back out. So we're measuring temperature. We have some probes measuring nutrient availability to, um, to the organisms living in this soil. There's the probes there again. Um, we use leaf litter bags, which some of you may have used, and I know my students, you'll be using um, a version of these, but we use dried out leaves from the plants that are normally in our plots, and we um, weigh them, put them into the ground, and then a ways down the road, we'll dig them up and weigh them again to see how fast they're breaking down. So we're interested in rates of decomposition here as well. Um, Riley? Anything else for the other factors we measured? Uh, no, we were just uh, a bunch of abiotic factors: yeah. so soil moisture, soil temperature, um, all these these basic things. Um, I think, yeah, no, I think that's that's about it. Just trying to get a these. So, like Nick mentioned, and you can see in this middle picture, um, just it's such a heterogeneous environment that we have five blocks of plots, and one of them is practically completely flooded right now and another one of them is totally dry so it's really it just changes really quickly um, you know just a few feet away yeah. uh, from one plot to the next so it's important that we measure a lot of different things to make sure that um, it's not the temperature or moisture that's driving the effects that we see yeah and there's some time again like I said it, it's quick to gather a lot of this stuff in the field relatively but there's a lot of time spent in the lab a lot of hours put in and this will go on. I mean, this is year two of a three-year study, and this goes on well into the year. I mean, long after Amanda leaves the field, she and others are still looking at these samples and processing them back at Duke. So it's, uh, it takes a while to understand these processes. Mm -hmm. um, and quickly here, because I'm looking at the time, 
I just want to point out, I've been very lucky to be surrounded by science. Uh, this is now, <laughs> today it's my favorite picture. This is a picture of myself holding a uh, white crown sparrow in the field with a, with a group. We caught these and took some blood samples from them. Um, got to go out trapping some squirrels to do population density studies there. And really, I mean, even just fishing to help people uh, catch fish, to do tagging studies there where they monitor populations as well. It, this is really such an amazing setting to be in. Uh, for any fan of science, you're surrounded by some really bright minds and some great projects and just being lucky enough to be part of a team where I can go out and work with other people and see what's going on and ask a million questions. It's just, <laughs> it's like science camp. Uh, it's like summer camp for science nerds mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, it really is. So, um, yeah, I, I do want to, yeah, that's why I'm trying to speed this up because I want to get to questions here because I've seen that some really good ones pop up and uh, I don't want to forget those, so we'll leave up our uh, thank yous here while we take questions. I guess there was one Sorry. question on funding about how the science is funded. Uh, I would say most of the projects up here are funded by the National Science Foundation through the Office of Polar Programs. Um, I'm kind of a unique case because I'm a graduate student, so I can't apply for those big grants. Um, so the funding for this project, as you can see, comes from a huge range of... of um, of different programs. Uh, this year we're funded in large part by the Park Service um, and also by conservation research and education opportunities and also some by the National Science Foundation and then some smaller grants by uh, a variety of other organizations. Okay, um, it looks like Krista has a question that she wants to ask you live, so go ahead Krista. Hi, Mr. Slade and um, Ms. Culp. I was wondering, does the all-day daylight affect the spiders at all as opposed to when they're experiencing all nighttime? Were you, are you asking about the effect of sunlight on them, like the 24 hours of sunlight, or like we couldn't really hear you very clearly? Well, since the spiders, sometimes they have all sunlight and sometimes they have all nighttime, I was just wondering how do they behave differently when it's all sunlight all the time? Yeah, that's a good okay. question. They do behave differently. Yeah, so we don't, uh, I'm trying to think, my first year out here, I was only here for three weeks, so sometimes I would be working in the field until one in the morning. In general, I think that they're more active during the day. At least the spiders, the, the big thing that affects them is the, the amount of solar radiation. So uh, so for right now, I mean, when it's raining, you can't find any of them. Uh, when it's cloudy, you can't really find them either. But like as soon as the sun comes out, they're running around. Um, and so in, I'm not totally sure because we haven't done a 24-hour sampling. That was one of the things that we wanted to do, we might get to this week, um, just out of curiosity to see what's active at night. Or well, at night versus what's active during the day, even with the 24-hour daylight. But um, we haven't gotten a chance to do that. But in general, I've noticed that if the sun is out, they're active. Um, and it, it really depends. Uh, there are other animals that uh, can be active 24 hours. It just depends on the weather. And there are other things like the Arctic ground squirrels that keep like a very strict diurnal schedule, even yeah. in the 24-hour daylight. So they're up at 8 in the morning. They go to bed, uh, you know, whatever, at 8 or 9 at night. Um, and the sunlight doesn't seem to affect them. Okay, um, let's go to Mike's question that he texted in and then we'll go live to Garrett. Okay, so um, for moisture absorption, so when we collect the, so we make these litter bags that Nick showed you. Um, and so we put dried leaf litter in there. So we dry it out in a drying oven, then we put it in the bags and, and put it out in the field. And then when we collect the bags, we weigh them when they're wet, and then we dry it out and use the dry one. So we can get an idea of how much moisture is there, but um, basically the, the soil is so wet here, uh, everything, is, everything is sopping wet all the time. Um, and so what we're really interested in is the, the dry litter, so the, the amount of biomass we have before when it's dry and the amount of biomass when we collect it again after two months once it's dried. That's a good question. Oh, sorry. But the, sorry. Okay. okay. How about Garrett? Oh, we're still. Oh, okay. But the soil moisture can uh, affect how quickly things decompose. If they're waterlogged and you're in, have anaerobic conditions, then uh, the decomposition will happen more slowly. And so that's one of the reasons why we measure the soil moisture a few times during the season. 
All right. Sorry about that. Um, we'll go to Garrett now if you want to ask you a question. What's been the hardest part about uh, getting used to the all-day daylights? Yeah, give me. Um, it, it really, it's been one of the nice things. It, I thought it was going to be difficult, and uh, luckily my tent is pretty dark, so I've really had very little trouble sleeping. Um, and I think it'll be harder the other way around when I go back to the lower 48 and uh, have to start budgeting my time where I can't just take off after work at 7 at night and go for a hike because it's going to get dark. It really is, um, it's one of my favorite things here. Being able to play t-ball at midnight is fun. Um, being able to go back out in the field to do work at night is such an advantage. So I really enjoy it. I find I have more energy. I find I, I require less sleep. So I, I think it'll be more of an adjustment on the other end. Um, I don't think I'd want to be here in winter, though. And do that yeah, I, I mean, I think it would be interesting to be here in winter. I, I find yeah, that, um, shortly. yeah, the natural light, having so much natural light, it definitely makes you feel like you have more energy. And then as soon as you go into your room and turn on artificial light, you get tired pretty quickly. And yeah. the, the long hours of work kind of catch up with you. Um, I don't know. I sleep with a mask, but otherwise, I love the 24-hour daylight. I think it's the coolest thing about the Arctic, and uh, I I always feel really sad when I go back home because I feel like I'm being cheated out of part of my day when it gets dark. Yeah, and uh, on the night of Fourth of July, we saw the moon for the first time since I've been here. Um, it happened to come up over the Brooks Range. It was still light out, but it was really exciting to see the moon, and everyone made the biggest deal of it, which was kind of neat because you know normally at home you, you don't and. Uh, it was a bit of a treat, but yeah, I think darkness is going to be strange. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like a couple of people are typing questions, is, um, but I haven't seen anything yet. Anybody else want to ask a question live? Or we wait? We just saw a question from uh, Kate Stewart on uh, is it gross living with so many spiders, or is it one of those things that makes your job interesting? Um, the spiders are really, one of the things that I'm realizing more and more is um, they are everywhere. And since working on this, other people who work in the field, like say bird, the bird people I was out with yesterday, they're hearing bird calls and identifying them before I'm even hearing them um, because that's what they're tuned into. And we spend so much time looking at the ground that when I go on hikes with other people, um, they're like, oh, I haven't even seen spiders. And it's all I've seen. I mean, the whole day I'm looking at and I'm seeing them. They're everywhere. So, Getting people to see that is one thing, but you know they they are all around us. But really, they're not gross. They're not the giant spiders that we have in the Carolinas. Um, these are relatively small, and they're kind of friendly-looking spiders, if you can imagine that. Um, you know, they're fun to work with. They're fast, but they're not. Um, there's really nothing gross about it. And handling them, I don't I don't know. And really, um, if you haven't seen the Meet the Team video with Amanda yet, you need to. Uh, because Amanda actually was scared of spiders before starting this. It's true, yeah. No, I never thought I would work with spiders. Um, never. Even if you asked me like three years ago, I never would have said I would work with spiders. Um, uh, but it's just, uh, it's just one of those. I also said I would never do scope work. I really hate being at the microscope. But now, I mean, do a lot of that. I, I think it's, uh, you know, you find questions that are interesting to you and then you figure out what the best system is to answer those questions. And for me, I was interested in predators and food webs and linking it to ecosystem processes. And so um, looking at spider predation, it just worked out. And um, you know, the spiders up here, they're, they're actually pretty tiny. And it's not that there are so many of them. Um, I mean, you see them running around on the ground. Um, it, but I think it's more that we're tuned into them. I think when Nick goes back to South Carolina, he's going to see spiders everywhere where no one else does. Um, it's just that we're, um, you know, things are so tiny here that we're paying a lot more attention to these little tiny animals and tiny plants. So Yeah, and we literally spend hours walking around in the field some days just looking for moving spiders. Yeah. And at first it was difficult just to catch 20 spiders. Um, but now we're catching, you know, 50 spiders with only females with egg sacs and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So we're excluding all the others. So yeah, it's a lot of observing what you're tuned into, I mm -hmm. think. Oh. All right. Looks like you got a couple of text questions there, starting with Gabrielle, and we'll let you answer those first. Hi, Andres. Um, so there are so. 
There are students from other countries here. There are some people from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, there are, well, I mean, there are people from Puerto Rico, so not another country, but there are, um, I'm trying to think where else. There were people from Spain here yeah. this year. Um, not so much Latin America, but um, yeah. I mean, there were some Japanese scientists here last year. So uh, there are people from all over the world that come to work here. Uh, it's really just a question of the funding that they can find to support their research. Um, and so the way that they get money to come do their research is they put in a, an application and a grant proposal and they ask uh, either the government or different kinds of organizations like the National Science Foundation or the Park Service for the research money to help pay for their research and to get them up to these remote locations to be able to, to do their projects. Okay, and then you got a question from Hunter about risk in the tundra. That's a, that's a good question, Hunter, about the, the risk to the tundra from us. Um, a lot of people ask about our risk from the, the things that surround us. But uh, yeah, there's uh, here's a picture of our naturalist, Seth, and he's he's actually observing those plants below him, and so that he's not walking and trampling on them, he's sitting on a boardwalk. And uh, you can see a little bit of that boardwalk behind him, and there's several, um, in most places, we, we do walk on these uh, boardwalks to minimize our impact. And even when we go hiking, we tend to spread out um, rather than a home where we walk single file on a trail to minimize our impact. Here it's a little different, so we fan out and walk side by side to minimize our impact. Um, but I, I think our impact here is quite minimal in terms of the work that we're doing because you have a lot of people living here, but we do keep most of our uh, impact concentrated on the pad, this elevated area where we are. We're hauling out all of our water, our waste um, gets incinerated or crushed and hauled out, and so it's a little bit of a different thing, but you know, I would say our impact is probably pretty minimal. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, there are big ecosystem experiments happening here. So mm -hmm. there are big experiments where people are adding nutrients to the environment, nutrients to streams, and and whatnot. But I think on the in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty minimal, and people are are very conscientious of not trampling things. So like Nick mentioned, I mean, there are, are kilometers of boardwalk leading out to research sites here, just so that you don't trample the tundra and make these these trails. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we do the best that we can, and um, it's, this is a, a research area, so it's at yeah. least um, in terms of the experiments and uh, in terms of having people walking on the tundra, it's, it's limited to a relatively small area. And uh, let's go to Garrett. He wants to ask a question live. When was Tulick Field Station established? Seventy-five or seventy-four, technically, I guess. It was. Um, <laughs> there's some. There's some different stories on this because I, I've looked this up to answer the question a little bit. Um, and I guess around 1974, 1975, they first set it up as a camp for workers on um, on the Trans Alaskan Pipeline, and that would have been in around 1974. Um, and then sometime later, groups of researchers looking for a lake that doesn't freeze to the bottom. Um, settled on this lake, and they've been up here in some fashion since then, but it's gone from being a very primitive place, and there are some old pictures, in fact, some of the structures are still here, um, from where it was basically a trailer and a bunch of tents, to it's over the years gotten continuously better, but... Yeah, I mean, it's become like a really big Arctic field station, but only relatively recently. Um, I think it ran for enough, quite, you know, at least a couple of decades being a pretty small-scale operation. Okay, and uh, you got a question from Deanna about hauling water? Yeah, um, for the water hauling, we have, uh, they bring in these large trucks, and I've got some, I put some of the stats of one of my entry, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. They haul like, a considerable amount of wastewater out, and they bring it up to uh, Prudhoe Bay, where it's treated in a wastewater treatment facility, much like you would have at home, um, well, not at home, but in your communities, and uh, then it's processed as gray water and solid waste up in Prudhoe. But it's, um, we do ship out a lot, and it's another point I want to make is we throw, even your toilet paper here has to go in trash can. So um, we have signs up beside the toilet to say if it doesn't come out of you, don't put it in the toilet. Um, and that's, it may sound a bit direct, but it's true. Uh, we, because if you put it in toilet paper, it takes up a considerable amount of volume, and we're paying to haul that out. So again, it's just, I guess, another way we minimize our impact. 
Okay. Um, like I said, we'll take another uh, about another ten minutes or so for questions, and then we're gonna sign off. But let's see. We have a question about how do spiders survive the winter months? From um, so, well, I don't know of any studies that of people that have come out to find the spiders in the winter. We know that as soon as the snow melts, they're among the first animals up and running around. Um, I would guess that they stay right. So basically, you can have a big snow layer, and then the, the permafrost is, is just frozen all the time. But it's right under the snow layer, right on the ground. It's fairly insulated. So you could have outside temperatures of negative 40, negative 50 degrees. Um, but under the snow layer, it could be um, not that far from zero. Um, so uh, I would guess that they probably stay in that kind of insulated layer on the ground. Um, there was a study um, from Brian Barnes at the University of Alaska Fairbanks with the Institute of Arctic Biology um, uh, looking at these, these antifreeze proteins. So basically, animals up here, they can either uh, be freeze resistant or freeze tolerant. And if they're freeze tolerant, they let their bodies uh, just completely freeze. Um, and you know they need special adaptations for that. If they're freeze resistant, then uh, one of the ways they can and prevent freezing is to have these special antifreeze proteins that it works like the antifreeze in your car, um, and they just kind of super cool their bodies. And so um, Brian Barnes had done a study um, where he looked at one particular wolf spider. Um, there are 10 to 12 species up here in, in this particular area, and so we know that at least one of them has these antifreeze proteins. I would guess then that, that most of them do, um, but we're not really sure. Okay, you got a uh, another question from Lisa Seth about specific ad adaptations. You see that? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess specific adaptations. I think the big one is uh, just being able to withstand these really extreme temperatures. Um, uh, They're smaller. Yeah. Oh, and so that's one adaptation. Mm -hmm, the bodies are smaller. Um, and the, just the temperature and the abiotic factors. One thing that's kind of interesting too is uh, we think of spiders feeding on, so if you look in a field for example, you would imagine the spiders are eating insects and the, the herbivores as part of the, the green food web if you will, so the insects that are eating the plants. But here, um, there really aren't that many herbivore insects. Um, if you go out and sample, you'll see a grasshopper every once in a while. Um, but a lot of the kind of typical spider prey that you would see down south, we don't have very much up here, or at least not enough to sustain the spider population. So that's one thing that we're looking at is um, just that the, the spiders are feeding on the, the animals from the soil food web, and they're also cannibalistic. And so we're trying to see like what, what exactly they're eating and uh, how that's different from down south. Okay, and Amanda is asking Nick, how are you going to apply what you've been learning to your classes this fall? Uh, <laughs> I'm both uh, excited and overwhelmed by that question. Um, one, I, I, we've been doing a lot of talk about setting up um, the mesocosms on my campus. Uh, we have a spot to do that, and it will require some manual labor for my students who are watching, so um, be ready to dig some holes. But yeah, we can do a lot of these studies with our wolf spiders at home. And really, you can tie in so many of the topics that we have to cover through this, um, from decomposition to nutrient cycling to predator-prey relationships. Uh, it's really limitless. And it's one of the boring topics you can really tie in through a hands-on activity like this. But also, um, like the ground squirrel work I was doing, we'll be expanding some of the other work we've already been doing at Clover, um, trapping field mice and using some of the same techniques that um, Michael uses in his squirrel trapping. Uh, the bird group I was out with yesterday has these really neat covers to look at um, predation effects of birds on arthropods and insects in, um, in grassland, well, in tundra areas. So for down home, it would be grassland areas. But what they're making to keep the birds out, um, to study areas where birds can be predators versus areas where you keep the birds out, it's PVC and bird netting. So, you know, I got to take good notes and ask a lot of questions on, well, wait a minute, how can I set this up for my students and what could we study? So, the number of studies is really, I think I could do a course just on, I don't want to say Arctic research, but field science mm -hmm. now, based on the things, a lot of the things that are done here, we can do on some scale um, at my school and we, we definitely will be. Okay. 
So let's see what else um, we have from uh, Victoria. What happens to the spiders after the two months you are all there? Well, it depends on which spiders. We have um, we have a number of them that are sitting in little vials of alcohol right now. Um, they'll go back to do to be dried out and ground up and processed for isotope analysis to get a better idea of what types of things they're eating. So where in the food web they're eating. Um, others will be. I mean, most of them are just going to be free. A lot of the ones that we catch here. Yeah, um, so like in our, our experimental mesocosms, like the picture yeah. that's shown right here, so we don't kill any of the spiders in there. So um, they'll just stay in the plots, and then we'll come, I'll come back in the spring and, and measure their densities to see um, how many of them remain. Um, and then next year, we'll at the end of the experiment, it's a three-year experiment, and so at the end of the experiment, then I'll collect them all and um, try and do things like measure body condition and whatnot. And, uh, but most of the spiders that we've actually collected, uh, as Nick mentioned, will uh, they'll be identified down to species. I'll measure their body sizes, uh, try and get their weight to get a measure of body condition. Uh, uh, some of the females with egg sacs, we're looking to see if they have parasites in their egg sacs. Um, and then they'll be ground up for, for isotope analysis. Okay. And um, looks like we got one more question. Have you been bitten by a spider yet? Um, I've been bitten by a couple hundred mosquitoes, but no spiders. Um, and really, they're they're quite easy to handle, mm -hmm. and so really, biting isn't a concern at all. Yeah, I think uh, in general, uh, biting spiders are not that common even down south. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think a lot of times when people think they've been bitten by spiders, it hasn't actually been by a spider; it's been by something else. So uh, yeah, it's not something we have to worry about. We handle them all the time here. And yeah. there are no poisonous spiders here anyway. There's nothing poisonous. I mean, some, a few plants, I guess, but yeah. no poisonous animals, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Okay. Well, I think we'll uh, wrap it up for the questions. And if you have uh, more questions for Nick and Amanda, you can certainly post them on the um, Ask the Team forum, um, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. And uh, thank you, too. You guys did a great job. Very interesting. Um, so you guys are uh, seeing some slides now about how else you can, or other places where you can follow uh, Polar Trek Adventures. We have a lot of teachers in the field right now all over the Arctic, so lots is happening. And a couple of other Polar Connect events we anticipate scheduling in the next couple of weeks from uh, various Arctic locations. So um, with that, Sarah and I are probably going to sign off here in a little bit, but we want to say thank you to everybody. And uh, it was nice hearing from you, Nick and Amanda, again. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in today. It's a, it's a lot of fun for us to get to do. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. OK, I'm going to stop the recordings. And also, just a reminder that the archives um, for both of these events, we're a little bit behind on those. Sorry, Nick. Um, we will post those up here on the website uh, in the next, uh, probably by the end of today. I'm a little behind myself. So. <laughs>